Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Ocean Expert Exchange. Scientists in every Florida school and the Anjari Foundation are very excited to have you join us again here today. Uh, we have a, an exciting semester of live webinar events on ocean scientists and the work that they do. In this monthly series, we dive into all things marine science and explore what's happening in the field interesting careers as well and more. Um, today, we will be speaking with Candace Fields of Florida International University. She will be sharing with us the conservation story of the ocean oceanic white tip shark. Uh, we will get to her in just a moment, but first we wanna tell you very quickly about our programs. The Scientist in Every Florida School is a free program housed within the University of Florida's Thompson Earth System Institute. The mission of CEFs is to engage Florida K-12 students and teachers in cutting edge research and provide science role models like today and experiences that we hope will inspire future stewards of our planet. Our partner, Anjari Foundation, is a nonprofit headquartered in West Palm Beach, Florida. Uh, the foundation supports and promotes marine science research and education, and many of the foundation's primary initiatives involve its 65-foot research vessel, the RV Anjari. In case you missed it, any of the information from today's preview slides, uh, we will be uh, reminding you to submit questions for the scientists by typing them in the chat box. We'll also provide a survey at the end of today's presentation for a chance to get yourself some really cool swag. So be sure to take part in that. At this time, we would like to introduce to you Candace Fields, who's going to tell us a bit more about herself, her research and its significance. And Candace, at this time, I'm going to head and stop share and let you take it from here. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Um, hopefully everyone's seeing my presentation, um, but I have now lost the Zoom because even though we've been doing the Zoom world for what feels like a century, somehow inevitably it always gets messed up. Okay. So. I can't see your presentation as of yet. Fabulous. I love that. Let's see. How about now? Looks good. Okay. All right, so good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for tuning in this morning and thank you to the Anjari Foundation and their partners for giving me this opportunity to talk to you guys a little bit about one of my favorite sharks, the oceanic white tip, and a little bit about some of the work I'm doing on them for my PhD. But uh, before I begin, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. So I am a PhD student at Florida International University uh, under the joint supervision of Drs. Damian Chapman and Giannis Papastamatiu in the Predator Ecology and Conservation Lab. Um, I'm also an adjunct scientist at the Cape Eleuthera Institute, which is in South Eleuthera in the Bahamas, where I'm from. And lastly, I am very proud to say I'm an ambassador for an organization called Sharks for Kids whose mission is to inspire the next generation of shark advocates through education, research, and outreach. So, um, you know, they do work that's kind of similar. Oh, my dog wanted to participate in the presentation, my apologies. Um, so they do work similar to the Anjara Foundation um, with a little more focus in uh, the Bahamas and currently Turks and Caicos. But I'm pretty confident nobody tuned in to hear me talk about me. Um, so let's dive into the oceanic white tip and some of my PhD work. So just for some background, the oceanic white tip shark, which scientific name is Carcharhinus longimanus, is a circumtropical pelagic predator that was once globally abundant, uh, which is really just a fancy way of saying that these guys live in the open ocean, which you can think about as a blue desert, which is pretty well depicted by this photo here. Um, and they have the capacity to inhabit tropical uh, or subtropical waters, um, and there used to be a ton of them. Unfortunately, however, over the past few decades, um, this species has seen a sharp decline in population. So as you can see by the trends shown uh, in these graphs here, which indicate a drastic decline in the catches of this species in a couple of different fisheries where they were often caught. And this is largely due to overexploitation and the incidental capture of these animals as bycatch, 
um, as well as the, the demand driven by the fin market. And for those who don't know who, what bycatch is, it's basically just anything that you catch that is not targeted. So if you are in a tuna fishery, for example, anything that you catch that is not tuna is considered bycatch. So all of those um, things resulted in the oceanic whitetip being listed as critically endangered by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, or the IUCN, uh, as endangered on the Endangered Species Act in the United States, as well as on Appendix 2 of CITES, uh, which is the, the Convention on the International uh, Trade and Endangered Species. So all of that is to say that if nothing is done or nothing is changed uh, in the near future, we can expect oceanic white tip shark to become extinct within our lifetimes. And that sounds like pretty bad news, um, but there is hope for the species as there's been pretty extensive work done over the past decade to better understand these guys using different number of tools. Um, and hopefully the work that I'm doing for my PhD will kind of add to that, that knowledge base as well as aid in the conservation of this species. But before I dive into my work, obviously there's a, a bit of a need to set the stage for, for how I got to where I am um, and what I'm doing. And so in 2013 to 2016, there was a long-term study done in Cat Island, the Bahamas, where oceanic white tips were caught and sampled for genetics. Blood was drawn and ultrasounds were taken to get a better understanding of their reproductive biology. Um, and they were also tagged with both an identifying tag which basically is just a small tag with a unique number where if you caught the animal again, you'd be able to know, okay, we already caught this guy. We don't need to resample it. Um, but also a satellite tag. So you could see their movements, several of the tracks, which you can see uh, in the figure here. And basically the most exciting thing for me and where my work kind of jumps off of is that numerous of the animals caught were females and many of those were actually uh, found and confirmed to be pregnant um, by ultrasound. And so that's really exciting because, okay, we have these tracks. We see that they're going from the Bahamas to the Greater Antilles in the summer and fall months, and we know that they are uh, pregnant and close to term in their pregnancy. So where does that take me? Well, we want to then be able to track the juveniles because, well, we now think that the Greater Antilles might be an important uh, pupping ground or nursery area for the sharks. And what's really cool is not, not much is known about the juveniles of this species. We don't know much about where these sharks give birth or where the young ones spend much of their time. So I'm hoping that in tracking some of the juveniles, uh, we'll be able to understand this a little bit better. And so to do that, we're going to use pop off satellite archival tags, um, otherwise known as PSATs, which are the same tags that were used in the study I just explained. Um, and this will give us information on the animal's temperature and depth, as well as you know where they're going um, based on light-based geolocation. And this data is really, really uh, imperative as it pertains to uh, trans-jurisdictional movements or movements between waters controlled and managed by different nations, because this will get us a better understanding of how much time these animals are spending in waters where there are strong protective measures, like the Bahamas, for example, versus when they're spending time in places with less uh, good policies in place to protect these animals. Um, and this is really, really important because if we have a better understanding of this, we can provide crucial information which can potentially inform both local um, policies at the local level or the national level, as well as the international level. The next part of my work that I want to share with you guys is about baited remote underwater video stations um, or BRUBS for short. And basically, this is becoming a very increasingly popular tool to look at relative abundance of different uh, species. Obviously, I'll be focusing on sharks. And this is because it is really cost effective and it's a non-invasive tool, which is the most important aspect, right? To When we do this work, that means we don't actually have to catch the shark. Uh, we don't have to touch the animal at all. All we do is set down this frame, which has a bait arm, which is what you can see here in the, in the video. And it has a camera attached to it uh, at a fixed distance behind it. And all we do is put 
the frame down, leave it for about 60 to 90 minutes, come back and later that day, look at the footage to see what was there. But obviously, you know, this video is from a coastal bruv where if you were listening to anything I said five minutes ago, you would not expect to see oceanic white tips here. So to remedy that, basically what I'm gonna do is pelagic bruvs. So I'm gonna be setting drifting frames. They won't look exactly like what's in this picture, but this is an example where we're going to look in this the blue desert, look in the open ocean to see uh, the assemblage of sharks, focusing mainly on oceanic white tips. And we're gonna do this work starting uh, in April, very excitingly, um, in Cat Island and Mayaguana in the Southwest Bahamas. And we hope to do this work annually for the next uh, two or three years to basically get a baseline understanding of what the, again, the abundance of the oceanic white tip shark is in this last Atlantic stronghold um, in the Bahamas for this species. And then of course, beyond that, we'll be able to look at the overall assemblage of sharks in the Bahamas, in the, in the open ocean. Um, this is also really important because the Bahamas is a, a shark sanctuary, which means that the capture, killing, our trade of sharks or shark parts is illegal and it's prohibited by law. But most of the Bahamian waters are actually open ocean and the protections there are much weaker than that of, the, of their coastal counterpart. So it's really exciting and really important to understand what's there so that we can kind of give policymakers um, how help them make an informed decision about how to best protect um, our waters. And then lastly, um, a little shift away from the fun, exciting catching of sharks to lab work um, is some work that I'm actually about 98% finished with. Um, and I hope to actually publish, you know, within this year and it's a genetics project. And so I won't go too deep into the genetic details at 10 in the morning for you guys, but basically using fins um, that were seized in a, in a pelagic longline, from a pelagic longlining vessel um, in Hawaii, as you can see in this picture, I'm going to get some tissue from the fin, a little small piece, and then basically I will extract the DNA from it. Um, specifically looking at the mitochondrial DNA, which uh, I'm sure many of you know is inherited from our moms only, okay? And basically what I'm gonna do is then do PCR, which we're all familiar with, a little too familiar with because of COVID. Um, and I'm gonna look at the different markers to see what levels of population structure there is. And so the goal of this is that I'm looking at fins from the Pacific Ocean, and I want to see how genetically similar or different they are from the Atlantic Ocean oceanic white tips and the Indian Ocean oceanic white tips. Now, this work, um, this same process has been done already. We know the differentiation between the Atlantic and Indian Oceans, so we want to see where the Pacific fits in. So basically, what we do is we get the sequences, we compare them. And then we are able to create this map here to see how um, closely related or how structurally different the populations are. And then in addition to that, we have some, some fins from the Hong Kong and mainland China uh, fin markets. And we'll actually be able to use those, those fins to trace, trace them back to the region of origin. So basically by having all of the sequences of the mitochondrial DNA from different ocean basins, we'll be able to say, okay, these fins from the Hong Kong market, 90% of them came from the Pacific Ocean or the Indo-Pacific. And that basically gives us an idea of where the policies are effective, you know, where conservation management and uh, fisheries uh, management policies are being effective for the protection of the shark versus where they are not. And we anticipate seeing very little input from the Atlantic Ocean, which is pretty good news because that's where this species overall is doing relatively well. Um, and to see a very strong, you know, most of the input being from the Indo-Pacific. So that's pretty much, you know, a, a basic, very quick summary of, of what I'm doing. Um, and 
how I hope to help in the conservation of the species. And so with that, I am happy to take any questions that you may have. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Candace, for sharing your work with us. I really enjoyed learning a lot about it and the work that you do. So as you mentioned, we're going to go ahead and transition over to our Q&A session of today's presentation. So if any of our attendees have any questions at all, I really encourage you to write them in that chat box and I'll go ahead and ask on your behalf. Uh, Candace, we're going to go ahead uh, with a question from Mary, who is wondering how you attach the trackers to the sharks. How do you attach the trackers to the sharks? Okay, so there's a couple of different ways. The two most common ways are what we call bridling it or to basically dart it into the muscle. So basically, let's see if I can pull up a plain picture. Okay. If we were looking at this shark here, right? Oh, so this is the dorsal fin. You would either basically, I don't know how to say this in a less terrible sounding way, but you basically just insert it into the mus musculature of the shark right around here um, with like a little dart. Um, you can think of it kind of like the end of a spear, for example, um, and it just sits right in the muscle of the shark and it kind of just drags behind the shark with it. Otherwise you would pierce a small hole through the dorsal fin and using a little bit of monofilament or like fishing line basically, you would uh, crimp the tag onto the fin and it would dangle right, right behind the shark there. So these are designed such that they minimize drag, right? Because you don't want to put anything that is going to reduce the shark's ability to swim or, or hunt or anything like that. So um, the tags are pretty non-invasive in that regard. And also you have to, um, the tags are pretty small, but these sharks are really large. So overall, it's not going to really have that much of an impact on the animal. So that's how the tags are inserted. And how long do the tags last? Good question. So the, the identifying tags that I was talking about, those can last for a variety of different times. Um, the, if you put a tag that's, we call a cattle tag, you would put that on the dorsal fin. Um, it's just like the, the tags that you would see on the ears of a cow um, on a farm. Those can last, you know, 10 ish years, um, but eventually they will actually grow out of the shark. Um, the other tags, we'll, you would put them again in this musculature. They, depending on when, how old the shark was when you put it in, again, it's the same around 10 years, but it depends because they can become biofouled or uh, basically covered in algae and things like that. Um, so they become unreadable, um, et cetera, et cetera. But the satellite tags, so you can program them for varying lengths of time from three days to a year. Um, depending on the the scale of data that you want to get. So the if you program it for three days, for example, you're going to get a ton of information on, of really fine scales, right? Maybe every second you might get some information. Versus if you do if it's programmed for a year, you're getting a much longer data set, but less time. So maybe it's just once a day uh, or once every other day you're getting the information. And then what's cool is the tag is actually after that time has, has gone by, it actually pops off of the shark and floats to the surface. Thank you. Well, we have several students from Ocala tuning in today, and they're wondering if it is illegal to hunt and kill oceanic white tip sharks. Good question. So the oceanic white tip is, in theory, pretty much the most protected shark that is out there. Um, it is, like I was explaining, it's on the critically endangered on the IUCN red list. It is managed by tuna regional fishery organizations in all of the ocean basins um, where they have um, quotas and things like that that restrict the capture of oceanic white tip sharks. Um, but obviously we know that they are still being caught because they exist in the fin market, right? So is it illegal? Really, it depends on which country's waters you're fishing in um, because again, you know, which is an overall larger issue in terms of conservation, different places have different management strategies. Um, so if you're in the Bahamas, for example, it's 100% illegal, but in other places in the world, um, it's, it's technically illegal in terms of um, 
the fact that if you're like a commercial fisherman or something, you're not supposed to catch them. But the biggest issue that most of these species face is, is enforcement, right? It's very hard to manage um, somebody going out into the middle of the ocean in the middle of nowhere and catching, a, a catching and killing a shark. It's, it's almost impossible to know that they're doing that because they're not gonna bring that shark back into land knowing that it's, its status is critically endangered and everyone would be like, you're not supposed to catch that shark. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, John says, you spoke about Bohemian waters being a shark sanctuary. How will the Bohemian government protect them based on budgets being low? He also mentioned that Chinese and other Asian countries are fishing offshore. Yeah, so that kind of ties in directly to what I was just saying before with the issue of enforcement, right? So the Bahamian waters are a shark sanctuary. Um, it became that in 2011. And the biggest issue is enforcement. The, the, the country is an archipelago of 700 islands and keys. Um, and it has about 500,000 kilom square kilometers of water that it's in charge of, right? And you can imagine that a country that has only 400,000 people cannot possibly manage that much water effectively. And so really, the, the overarching hope is that, firstly, it's, you know, people will self-police. Um, if you are out fishing, for example, you will kind of keep each other accountable, knowing that, okay, we all know these are the laws of these waters. Um, we need to keep each other in check. Um, secondly, the, the, the biggest reason that this is successful is that in the Bahamas, sharks are not each eaten um, or consumed culturally, right? So we don't, a lot of Caribbean places eat shark, but the, in the Bahamas, that's not a very common practice. And so the, the demand for shark catching is not as high. And so the government kind of relies on that as well. Um, in terms of the, the offshore fishing, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's also hard to, to quell that um, based on our management capacity. Um, there, there is poaching that happens in our waters. But one thing that's that you have to consider is there's a difference between fishing offshore in a country's jurisdiction and fishing on the high seas, because there are parts of the ocean that are technically controlled by nobody. And so there's a lot of kind of, um, you know, borderline things being done on the high seas that really nothing can be done about. Thank you. Uh, Matthew shared, I know that finning is a big problem in the Asian market, but is it prominent in the U in US and Europe as well? Yeah, so I think overall, we, you know, we think about finning, the fin trade as equivalent to finning, right? But that's not as much of an issue as it used to be. You know, in the past, it was a very common practice to catch the shark, cut the fins off and put it back in the water. Now it's much more that the shark is caught and the entire shark is used or is processed, right? The, the meat is sold, the fins are sold. Um, so yes, we do have a shark, there is a shark fin market, um, but you know, it's not this terrible practice where they're just um, inhumanely killing these sharks. Um, so it is, fins are, are sold across the globe. Um, there are some, some better rules in the US. I think there was actually a rule passed recently which banned the fit trade of fins in the US. Um, so it does exist beyond Asia, really, which I think is the crux of, of your question. Mark asks, how big of an effect do MPAs have on protecting sharks since shark can swim in and out of these areas? That is a very good question. So MPAs, you know, they do they do have an impact, right? If if a shark is in an MPA, um, they're obviously protected there. But just as you noted, they are very mobile animals, right? And something like oceanic white tip, for example, they are super highly migratory. So they rarely are remaining within an MPA or any sort of protected area. So they are not as helpful for highly mobile animals like sharks. And often when they're being created, sharks are not really taken into account. 
um, because otherwise you would have to have these enormous MPAs, which are, uh, you know, cost prohibitive, which are not going to be, you know, the larger the MPA, the less supported it's going to be by fishermen and, and other local stakeholders. So it's a, it's a big challenge. So I would say MPAs, like in and of themselves are less effective for sharks, but because there are often what we call an MPA network, right? Generally, there's not just one MPA in a place, there's multiple, that aspect um, can benefit sharks. And just to take a step back for any of our younger attendees today, can you tell us what MPA stands for and a little bit about what it is? Yeah, so MPA means Marine Protected Area. um, And it's basically a region that the country whose waters you're talking about designates as an area where now there are different levels of MPAs, but generally speaking, it means that there's, you're not allowed to like fish in this area. You're not allowed to take anything out of the water from that region with the goal of kind of increasing biodiversity or protecting a very crucial spawning habitat for a certain fish species or something like that. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Sarah's curious, how can you accurately determine the global population of a shark species? That's a very good question. So it's hard to, in terms of like numbers, it's hard to say the exact number of shark or any species really out there. Um, but with the genetic tools that I'm, that I was discussing, you can get a, a rough estimate of, of the population, but more importantly, Um, or more relevantly, I would say, you get an understanding of the trend of the population. So whether the population is declining, whether the population is decreasing, and then also you get an understanding of how genetically diverse is this population. And that links to its potential to adapt to evolutionary changes, to environmental changes. And it basically gives an indication of the likelihood that this animal will continue to survive or whether it'll be driven toward extinction. Uh, Mia is currently at CEI in the Bahamas and has noted that a lot of bull sharks, almost solely pregnant females come through seasonally. For the pregnant white tips, were they in the Bahamas during a particular season? Yes, so I imagine that you're seeing these bull sharks that I'm very familiar with in the the Cape Luther Marina. Um, and those do come in in the winter months and they are, like you said, mostly pregnant females. Um, for the white tips, they we typically see them, you know, in late winter to, to spring, kind of um, anywhere between, you know, late March to, to May-ish, maybe June. That tends to be the type of time we, we see them um, in the Bahamas. Now, that's not to say that they're, other times that they are they are they're there, but the the research has shown that those tend to be the times that those gravid or or quite pregnant females are are in the Bahamas. Freya asks if the DNA samples you're collecting are being shared with others for their studies, such as research into differences in toxin levels. Oh, that's a great question. So these samples that I have right now, we don't currently have any requests for sharing them, but um, should those arise, we are more than happy to share samples. Um, A lot of our work, you know, and most work in in science is done via collaboration um, and would not be possible without the sharing of samples and sharing of information. So um, that's definitely something that I'm open to um, and uh, any information we can find on the species, the more the merrier. Jessica would like to know if you've considered using stereo BRUVs uh, for length measurements and identify adults versus juveniles or to identify adults versus juveniles. Yeah, so for for the coastal stuff, we don't use uh, stereo video, but for the pelagic bruvs that we're gonna start in April, we do hope to use a stereo setup um, to just like you said, get a better idea of uh, some measurements. Um, We don't anticipate seeing any juveniles, um, but this would, you know, we'd be able to, to know this from getting those measurements. Um, and we also hope to use um, the videos to get an understanding of how many individuals there are, because you can use, you know, the white tips have very distinctive uh, fin markings, right? They have the white tips 
classic scientists are not very creative. Um, that's how they got their name. And each shark has different markings. So we'd actually hope to be able to use those markings to say not only mm -hmm. um, the relative abundance, but actually how many individuals we're seeing within you know each each set within the population there. Eric asks if oceanic white tip sharks are ever found near Palm Beach, Broward, and Dade counties. Yeah, there are some some um, reports of oceanic white tips being found off of uh, West Palm. You know, again, this, these guys are found pretty far offshore, um, so it's not a overly common sighting. But there there definitely are you know sightings of them in in Florida. Chandra wonders what kind of training is provided to help in the proficiency in tagging sharks to minimize injury to them. Like for, well, I can just explain my training, I guess. So shark uh, research and shark tagging is definitely something that really can only be learned by doing. Um, it's very hard to you know, watch a presentation about tagging sharks and then just be able to go out there and do it. Um, and every shark, every individual is different and every species is different as well. You know, some species go into tonic immobility, which is that kind of trance-like state um, that I'm sure you've heard about on things like Shark Week and Shark Fest really easily when their flips upside down. Some sharks basically don't go into that at all, right? And that's something you can't really learn without having experience catching numerous sharks and tagging numerous sharks. So really the, the training is getting out there with experienced um, researchers, experienced shark handlers, and just getting as much practice as you can with each mm -hmm. step of the process, right? Practicing just securing the shark over and over again, then moving on to practicing, mm -hmm. taking a sample over and over again, and then practicing, you know, uh, controlling the head over and over again. Um, so really the, the, the only real way to learn these, these skills is to get out there and do it. We have several students in attendance today who are wondering what the oceanic white tip eats and what its predators are. Yeah. So the oceanic white tip is an apex predator, so it doesn't have too much, uh, natural predators of it, of it. Um, but you know, a, a baby oceanic white tip is definitely fair game for any other shark species to eat. Um, things like orcas um, can eat sharks. Um, you know, they're super, super smart and can hunt, you know, in, in their pod and things like that. They oceanic white tips like to eat things like squid. Um, so you'll often actually find them trailing pilot whales who also are, are making these kind of deep dives to find squid. Um, for the, and they, so, but because, like I said, they live in this open ocean, this de blue desert, they don't have the luxury of being as picky as other species might, right? Because food is quite scarce in their environment. And so they have to be uh, relatively opportunistic in their eating. Lynn from Sweden would like to know if it's mostly genetics and lab work included when working with sharks. Or are there other methods that scientists use as well? Oh, that's a good question. So it's, I would say it's, it varies across the board based on what you're actually interested in learning. So, you know, if you're interested in movement, it's basically 100% field work, getting out there and, and tagging the animal and looking at their tracks. Um, if you're doing, you know, if you want to look at toxins and stuff like that, obviously, again, it's mostly lab work, but the thing, obviously, to do the lab work, a lot of times you have to get out there and, and catch the shark, right? A lot of work is not is done from, you know, fresh tissue, which comes from people going out there and catching the shark. So I would say it it's really variable based on, you know, what you're trying to understand. But I think that there is no uh, it's not more lab work or more field work or vice versa. I would I would honestly say that. It's honestly a lot of computer work, <laughs> um, far less of the exciting uh, catching sharks or, or doing, doing fun lab analysis. Sure. Uh, Tony asks if oceanic white tips break the surface enough to use spot satellite tags. 
Um, so they do break the surface, but I would say no. Um, they don't. They they kind of they're not really breaking the surface unless there is some sort of active feeding event or something like that happening. It's not like a great white shark, for example, which um, O search they'll use spot tags and get their pings every time the fin reaches the surface. Um, but really, it's hard to say because just spot tags have not been used historically to to look at these guys. So I would say from what we know, it would not be the right choice. Um, but, uh, you know, anything is possible. Uh, Mary's students would like to know what happens to the trackers when a shark dies. Good question. So it depends on. Well, firstly, it depends on the, like I said, the duration of the, the tag that you programmed it for, right? So if the shark dies because of the stress of the capture event, what basically happens is the, the satellite tag is programmed to understand that at a certain level, a certain amount of time of consistent depth, which is one assumption that it's died, right? It hasn't moved at all from this exact depth for three days the tag automatically pops off. Um, so basically the tag itself has a couple of built-in functions so that the tag can still be recovered even if the animal dies. That's fascinating. Um, some Florida students would like to know if your job is difficult and what the most challenging part is. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> I think... <laughs> I mean, being a PhD student, I think in any field is difficult, um, not just if you're looking at sharks, but it definitely is a lot of hard work. Um, when you're doing field work, it's a lot of very long, physically and mentally taxing days. Um, and it is a lot of, like I said, a lot of computer work and a lot of just learning how to deal with the information that you've gotten. Um, but it's very rewarding at the same time. So uh, it makes it worth it. Absolutely. We're going to wrap up with just a few more questions. The next one is from Allison who asks, what is your advice for people who want to go into the marine biology career, career field? Yeah, so I think my biggest <clears throat> advice would be don't let, how should I phrase this? it doesn't matter what path you're on, you can always end up doing marine biology. So for example, my undergraduate degree is in neuroscience, which basically has nothing to do with what I'm doing now, um, but I'm still here as a PhD student, right? So if it's something that you feel passionate about, you can seek out, you know, volunteer opportunities, you know, really just get, get your hands dirty and see if it is something that you like. Um, and again, like I said, don't be uh, fearful that where your path is now doesn't lead to, to where you think you want to go, because there's no one right way to get into this field. That's a very important message. Uh, several folks are asking if there are any internship or assistant opportunities in your project or other related ones they may um, make in the future, as, uh, as well as other opportunities to get involved. Yeah, so for my project specifically, there's not too much um, assistance that that I can offer uh, assistance opportunities that I can offer mainly because the most of the work that I'm doing is in the Bahamas, which has recently changed its permitting process, which could be a whole nother hour long Zoom uh, talking about that. So for my personal work, no, but like I said, I. Um, I'm now an adjunct scientist at CEI, but I started as an intern there. They have a lot of great internship opportunities um, for marine biology in general, um, not just focusing on sharks. Um, you can volunteer with programs like Sharks for Kids, like what I was talking about, where you're able to, you know, really inspire kids to just become fascinated with sharks, right, and to learn why they're important and kind of change people's perspective from a young age on why sharks matter and, and why they're important. 
Um, and I mean, there are tons and tons of, of internship opportunities. You can get, do things at aquariums or things, you know, there are very, very uh, varied opportunities out there to just kind of put, put your toes in the water a little bit um, and see, see what the field is like. Sure. Our last one is from uh, students from Ocala and Tallahassee, and they're really interested in knowing what they can do to help and how they can um, get them off the critically endangered list. Mm. I mean, I think the biggest the biggest way to help really is is just education, um, informing people about the importance not only of of oceanic white tips but of sharks in general for the for the ecosystem. Um, why? Uh, an ocean without sharks is something we should be more fearful of than an ocean full of sharks. Um, and then also just, you know, making informed choices when you're, when you're out there fishing or things like that, right? Making sure you understand how to, if you catch a shark, safely release it. Doing things like reporting sightings, if you're in the States, reporting sightings of the oceanic white tip to NOAA um, or other, you know, local entities that are able to use that information for us to learn more about them, learn where they're going and all these things. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's a very, very uh, large task for these guys to become uh, removed from the critically endangered list, but through, like I said, education and just spreading the word about the animal's importance, I think that's really the best thing that you can do. Well, Kellis, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you and learning from you. Thank you so much for your time. At this point, I'm going to turn things over to Stephanie to wrap up today's event. Thanks, Brian. And thank you to everyone for joining us today. A special thanks to Candace for taking the time to share her fascinating work with us. If you'd like to take a look at the K-12 extension activities that are related to today's topic, you can find them. They're made available along with a recording of today's session at the UF Earth Systems YouTube channel. Please take a moment also to complete the survey. The link has been shared in the chat box for you. We would really appreciate that feedback. And finally, for more information about the Scientist in Every Florida School program uh, and, Science, and Anjari Foundation, you can visit our websites and our social media. As mentioned earlier, we also are just uh, taking up our first spring semester session today. We have a great lineup in store for you. April 5th, we will be joined by Dr. Valeria Pizarro and the, of the Perry Institute of Marine Science. She'll be talking about stony coral tissue loss disease, what's known about it, uh, what's being done to protect coral reefs around the Caribbean. Um, so you can learn more about that on um, that date, as well as May 3rd, we're going to be speaking, uh, learning more about a speaker coming soon. So we'll share that with you shortly. Uh, thanks very much for attending today, and we hope you have a fabulous day.